and we will share a QR code link to our survey. Okay, now it's over to our panel for this evening, all studying at the University of New South Wales, each from different academic disciplines and all having a shared passion to influence change for the environment through their everyday actions. Please be introduced to Karina Williams, Damla Hatapeglu, Laura Brown and Anna Ho. Karina Williams is our panel convener for this evening. Karina is a first year environmental science student at UNSW and has been volunteering at Thoughtful Foods, a volunteer run non-for-profit food cooperative located at the university since she was 16 years old with the goal to change her lifestyle in order to make a bigger impact on the people around her and her ecological footprint. I'll now hand over to Karina who will introduce her fellow panelists. Over to you, Karina. Hi guys, hi everyone. Um, I hope you guys are looking forward to a good evening. So we'll introduce everyone. Um, so we'll start with Laura. Um, would you like to give us a little intro about yourself, who you are, what you study, um, and how you are involved in environmental and climate um, activism? Yeah, thanks, Karina. Thanks, Helen. I just want to first acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose lands I live and I'm speaking to you from now. Um, yeah, I'm a student at UNSW studying environmental humanities um, in a Bachelor of Arts and I've been volunteering and coordinating at Thoughtful Foods Cult for the last few years um, and also involved with the UNSW Environment Collective and Fossil Free New South UNSW, um, both student led um, organizing groups. And that's the, my general background <laughs> and experience. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and Damla? Hey, um, I'm Damla. I am a third year industrial design student at UNSW. Um, I am also a volunteer of Thoughtful Foods, and I've been coordinator uh, of volunteers for the past few months now. Um, my involvement um, with this issue is um, through my involvement with Thoughtful Foods, but also um, being a student activist um, throughout my uni degree. Um, and in my design practices, I try to aim for um, sustainable uh, involvement and um, environmental sustainability as much as possible. And that's, yeah, that's basically me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Damla. Um, and finally, Anna. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from uh, stolen Vigil land and extend my respect um, to Vigil elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to the elders of the lands, which um, all of you are zooming in from tonight. Um, I'm Anna, I'm a third year science and law student in science. I'm majoring in maths and I'm minoring in climate science. Um, I'm also the UNSW SRC environment officer um, this year and I've been involved in the environment collective uh, basically since my first year um, and our goal is to mobilize as many students as possible in mass democratic uh, climate mobilizations because we see the solution to the climate crisis as one of being of collective action and collective response. Awesome, thank you very much, Anna. So guys, we've got a small group tonight um, and because of that, feel free to pop your mics on to uh, shout out any questions you like or feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and don't be afraid to turn, show us your faces as well. We'd love to see them as well. So. We'll begin with just getting a bit of a feel of how our panelists felt about the movie uh, and the documentary. So in particular, what your initial thoughts were and how you feel about it and how you relate to it as a young person. Uh, we'll start with Damla. What did you feel? Yeah, um, I was strangely impacted by I didn't expect such an emotional response from myself, but um, I really, I really felt um, that she was everything that, you know, she was talking about, it really related um, to myself personally. And um, I think the way 
I, what really inspired me was the way that um, she practices um, being environmentally conscious in her day-to-day -day life um, and uses that because she's now she has the power. Um, I was really impressed by um, how she uses her actions um, like as a symbolic gesture of how people should be acting. Um, and yeah, basically that's my reaction to it. And Laura, did you feel a similar way? Yeah, I did actually. I also felt very emotional and I cried a lot throughout. I mean, I'm sure others here tonight also had an emotional response. And for me, that was really uh, resonant because I'm in also interested in filmmaking and especially documentary making around environmental issues because of the power I believe film has to, to really affect people and audiences. And I felt that myself watching the film um, and I also really kind of related to her in the moments where we saw her be really vulnerable and, and talk about um, burnout and, and how it was affecting her, you know, personal life, um, because that issue is really relevant for, for all, like, climate activists. Um, so those were my, yeah, kind of major takeaways. And you mentioned that as an art student, it really resonated with you. How would you say film is going to potentially change people's perspectives on this climate emergency? I think because of the emotional responses that it can incite rather than, um, but also as an educational tool, so providing information and facts about the issue, but more so I think as an emotional incentive because that's what really connects people to an issue and I think is the thing that really incites them to action. Um, and film is a is a beautiful tool to do that. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Um, and Anna, what did you feel towards the film? What resonated with you? Um, as someone, I guess, who's been um, sort of following Greta, like in the news and the media ever since she's been quite big, um, it was a really moving film, but I also don't think that there was necessarily that much that was particularly new. I think one of the things that um, like really draws um, you know, this generation to Greta Thunberg is that she has um, a really appropriate response to the climate crisis that seems to validate a lot of feelings of frustration that um, people in our generation have. So that is, you know, kind of a recognition that the solution to the climate crisis isn't to be found in particular halls of power um, or even conferences like COP26, which are coming um, up at the end of this month. And so uh, I guess uh, those feelings of frustration and um, the deep hypocrisy that she often sees within those leaders um, are ones which really resonated with me. Um, I think, I mean, I, I can't, like really confessed to having the same um, like all can or what she sometimes describes as an all consuming fixation on the climate crisis and like that anxiety. But um, I like, like where a lot of source of my um, desire to participate in climate activism comes from is also from this kind of spiritual place where I see, um, you know, the earth and the environment as something that like lasts longer than me. Um, and uh, in that sense, uh, really driven by this really spiritual desire to protect it. That's really, that's really deep because um, it's true. And I feel a very similar way. Um, you also mentioned, you know, how Greta is kind of embodying and exemplifying all of our um, collective emotions in this age group. Um, how can you speak from your experience as being part of activism and youth um, climate strikes and being on an organizational front? Um, so you've had a lot of experience with that. What are some insights into that? How did you get involved? What What are your upcoming things? What are you planning on doing now? Yeah, that's um, a bit of a multi-part question. So um, I'll just try to uh, respond to the parts that I can think of. Um, so the first part of that question, I think, is where have I um, experienced frustration before um, in the same way that 
Berthando maybe does. Um, I think it's when, I think it really dawned on me when I was listening to Scott Morrison talk on the news um, after the IPCC report came out, which was basically explaining how, oh, you know, um, Australia has met the targets that it set out for itself. Like we are on track to like beat um, these uh, greenhouse gas targets that we set for ourselves like back in 2005. Um, you know, we just need to wait for technology in order to like solve all these problems for us. And I just like, like from somebody who's been, who, who likes to keep on top of the news and who like gets involved in climate activism, like I, I just know that, that that's just such a disingenuous claim, um, disingenuous claim because like this is the same government that um, over the last month has actually approved like four new coal mine extensions in New South Wales alone. Um, and when you actually dig deeper into that claim about um, how Australia is like meeting all these targets um, when it comes to uh, like fossil fuel reductions, um, that's actually through all these accounting loopholes and like carryover carbon credits um, that we uh, attained all the way back when John Howard was negotiating um, as part of the Kyoto Pro Protocol. It's like a whole complicated mess. Uh, so I, I think, you know, you only really have to turn on the news to feel a deep sense of frustration um, whenever like our politicians get fact-checked on something that they say. Um, as for things that are coming up right now that the UNSW Environment Collective is organizing around, um, we are organizing the first major um, climate mobilization in Sydney since um, obviously lockdown. Uh, which is going to be in response to COP26, in fact, and calling out the hypocrisy and greenwashing of the international community, but especially Australia's role in that, um, and putting forward what we see uh, as like the actual solutions to the climate crisis. So those are demands like 100% uh, uh, like renewables, uh, publicly owned renewables by 2030, um, and... Uh, uh, solidarity with First Nations people and First Nations-led land management. Amazing. Thank you, Anna. Um, so we touched on what we can do in part as part of groups uh, and how there's or, like organisations that are striving towards goals. Dumla, on the other side, as someone who isn't necessarily an organiser of like a climate youth action strike, um, you've attended some strikes in the past. Can you tell me about your experience with those and why it's important to go and the power of being in a group? Yeah, definitely. Um, so my experience with going to protests in general has been probably very different to um, the Australian experience because um, I come from Turkey and um, going to protests in there uh, when living there is a very different experience, it's a very violent experience. And um, coming from there and moving here, um, I was actually, even if um, it was said to be a, a peaceful protest, I was concerned for myself and my safety when I, um, when I came here and I started attending protests. But um, soon after, you know, starting to get, starting to get involved in that and seeing that not all of them end in the way that it does um, in what I've experienced back home, um, I started to get more comfortable with it. And um, I realized even if I'm not at the place where I uh, am organizing an event like that, even if I'm just attending, if I'm just holding up a sign, if I'm like chanting with other people, that has a power of its own because every person at that pro protest is actually you know, voicing their opinion, like just showing up and being part of the numbers is actually saying something, it's actually expressing something. Um, so that's kind of been my experience with that. That's really interesting, the contrast from coming from somewhere where protests can be violent and here it is a different type of protest and everyone's coming together to express their passion for that one thing. Um, Laura, on a similar note, how do you feel being part of groups and 
what sort of groups have you been a part of and how has your involvement um, made you feel more connected to con contributing a solution to the climate emergency? Yeah, so group being part of group action is just so empowering on, a, on an individual level because it really feels like something is happening. I'm, I'm with other people that feel the same as me. So when I started at university, um, I, I was living on the Central Coast and I thought university would be this great experience where I made all these friends in class. And that turned out to be not the case at all. And I felt quite isolated at, until the point at which I started getting more involved with Fossil Free UNSW, which was a campaign that was most active maybe in 2018, 2019. And that was, yeah, that kind of just changed the game for me. And from that point on, that, that point in time correlated with when I started to get involved with Thoughtful Foods because I realised that the, the connections that were being made in groups like that in, in student-led um, activist spaces concerned with environmental issues, that was, that was what was kind of like giving me life and like making me motivated. So being part of a group, even just as an attendee, um, not necessarily as an organiser, is really motivating and and just encourages you to keep going. And I know from talking to, uh, for example, my housemate who, who missed the last protest and she was just like devastated. And not only that, she felt like a disconnect from the movement and she was not sure like, you know, how she was contributing and, and kind of had like some, like an existential crisis over that. Um, so I think it just, showed me that the movement is an appropriate word because it, it really gains momentum the more the more you engage with it and and the more events you attend and as much as you can be involved. So we've highlighted the importance of being part of a group. Laura, Greta has in some ways been idolised and become this role model as this head of a movement in some could say a very isolating manner. Um, you could see in the documentary, the insults, the almost abusive language um, that many politicians and grown adults were calling this at the time, she was 15, 16. Um, how would you say you can relate to this sort of attitude how have have you experienced it in your life um day-to-day -day goings um and how do you feel you can create some sort of difference from just being one person to many um honestly i probably wouldn't claim to have experienced anything like um, what we see greta go through um and I think it, it probably is a, well, she is in a unique position of, of being like, like an act, like a celebrity in her activism. And I think that the, the real serious, dangerous response to her activism, which we know does happen to climate activists throughout the world. Um, but with Greta, in Greta's case, we can see it played out in the media and people are open openly against her. And I think that just shows that she's right. Like she's just right. And people are so threatened by what she's proposing, um, which is that systems need to change. Um, and that's threatening people so deeply that they would attack her. Um, and that, I found that really, another thing really emotional about the film and seeing that effect especially on her father, it was interesting that we saw it at an individual level, um, which I guess is, is, you know, probably one of the motivations behind the documentary because we all know her name, but it really showed, you know, she's a teenage person. Um, so that would be hard on anyone. Um, and I've forgotten, sorry, is Karina the, the second part of your question? <laughs> oh, that's so good. I think you covered it. Uh, it was more like, you know, the scrutiny, the disbelief the lack of you know people wanting to believe like thinking that it's a matter of belief rather than 
scientific truth. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, I have another question in regards to um, it, climate change being this massive umbrella term that, you know, someone say it's greenwashing the media where we don't actually have this solid thing of what climate change is. Like, yeah, there's CO2 in the air, but there's not enough uh, like for it to actually mean a difference, um, which is, you know, a common argument, whereas it's about the growth over the past 50 years um, of CO2. How, Anna, can you, you know, make a difference, feel like you're making a difference on an individual scale when climate change is a really huge thing? Yeah, um, I think this is a really important question to discuss because the way that um, I think the system likes to tell people that they make change is by heroizing certain individuals um, and putting them on the platform. And I think that really obfuscates the way that um, change really happens. So, for example, um, like that's when we want to give a Nobel Peace Prize to Greta Thunberg, quite understandably, um, but we aren't really going to give, like, say, a Nobel Peace Prize to um, Indigenous groups um, across, like, the world who have through the power of collective action and sometimes, you know, occupying um, extractive project sites for, like, years on end um, have finally, like, shut down those projects, like, and brought them to their knees. Um, it's uh, like this whole attitude of looking at individual success um, exists in, I think um, the royal family has like set up this kind of prize for um, who can devise the best technological um, solution to climate change. And it went to like this really amazing scientist who was able to find out how we can like save coral in certain areas. But you have to look at how much that prize money really means when like, billions of dollars are being spent every year as subsidies to fossil fuel industries, right? So um, I really try not to think of myself as like this one individual activist, like like just just like flipping the bird at like the government. I, I, I do try to think of myself as someone who lends their time and energy um, to collective groups and then like eventually by trying to, you know, start from where I am, like which is the UNSW campus and like politicizing students and getting them to understand that like you really do have power when like you choose to like take a day off university and like bring the university and society to a halt. Um, when I think of like my actions through that lens, um, it's uh, a lot more powerful for me in that respect. Um, and also because um, not only do I see my actions as them being more powerful, but it means that um, I experience less burnout. So I've uh, read this quote quite a while ago, which was like, being part of a social movement is kind of like being in a choir, because it means that if you're holding a note for a really long time, if you need to take a breath, like the note will go on without you. And then you can like join the choir again, like, when you've like gained your breath. And um, I, I think that's a really reassuring and empowering way for people who want to do something in the climate movement, but feel that it's all upon their shoulders. I love that analogy as someone yeah, who is that in choir, that, that's really yeah. relevant. Yeah, definitely. And so just like highlighting how it's about perspective and having a really great support network and people like-minded individuals who who can come together. Um, Damla, we've got a question in the chat. Have you read it? No, I haven't. Essentially, um, we have how Greta has a lot of responsibility weighing down on her shoulders and the frustration building up as world leaders seem to be doing nothing. And how almost people, like our leaders are inviting Greta to talk at their conferences in a trophy-like manner. Um, how how as young people do we cope with this frustration our leaders are doing next to nothing um 
and nothing seems to be changing, what do you do to cope? I think it's really easy to fall into this kind of slump of being um, negative or nihilistic about your outlook on these types of things. And when you're putting in so much effort into something and not seeing an immediate um, result of that and response to that, it's like this person said, it's really easy to get frustrated. Um, I think the way that I personally combat it is um, seeing how getting involved in the community and having like a day-to-day -day relation to it actually um, brings about discussions that um, I never thought I needed to have and you know um, were meant to happen. I think what's really powerful is through talking to one another, we can realize how we can enact change. And for me, coping with it is true, staying in touch. And even though, you know, um, it's easy to get frustrated, just not just keep on going, but also um, being there for one another in the, in the community, I think. Yes, definitely. Um, and can you tell me how you're part of many different communities? Can you pick one of them and how talk about your involvement in it in particular? Yeah, I think the one that uh, for the environmental um, cause, I think the one that I'm most involved in on a day to day basis is thoughtful foods. Um, and I think, yeah, just like, even if it's like a customer coming in and having that conversation with me, um, talking about what they do in their day to day life, and you know, how coming in there kind of changes that. Um, I think that's, that's my personal connection. And that's, I feel like how I keep that fire going for myself. Yeah, awesome. So it's really about connecting community. Um, Laura, I've got, Dredda says during the film, if the solution to the climate crisis was eating vegetarian one day a week, then it would, wouldn't be a crisis. Um, how does Greta's message call you to action and how does it make you reflect and resituate your actions to res in response to the climate crisis? Yeah, that, that quote, well, when she said that, that really hit home because I'm someone who happens to be a vegetarian um, and happens to shop at a low waste grocery store, but when she said that it really reinforces um the fact that for me well the fact that mass mobilization around the climate crisis is really the thing that will make change and when I think about you know for my own self what actions I want to take um the two um like the the larger scale being involvement in those kinds of um, mass mobilizations, as well as the, the everyday decisions I make about my own life. Um, they just um, reinforce each other and kind of go hand in hand. Um, so yeah, it's just, I think about the personal decisions that we make for ourselves. Um, but, but yeah, when she, when she's saying that she's really saying the, despite what the politicians want us to think, which is that each of us are responsible for saying no to a plastic bag. Meanwhile, they don't do anything to ban plastic bags um, at a, in a serious way. Just shows that um, what like They're what enablers. we call is yeah. Well, They're it shows enablers. that they they know what what the real solution would be. And they are trying to deflect from that by making us as consumers, because we're all consumers, um, think that it's up to our decisions to make the change. But I see it as I'm making a decision based on my own values. But the the real change comes from mass mobilization. So yeah, when Greta said that, it it really um, reinforced that for me, um, and that resonated with me. I think um, I'll just add to that. I think the important thing is um, to stop being complacent. 
to have an action that you do in your life that um, does bring about that change and is you're you're in the discussion you're you're keeping that going because even though it feels like a small action you're actually just um, kind of expressing that on the in the tables where they're talking about the bigger things like you know investing in fossil fuels you are against that you are you know making that statement I think that's what it's about definitely um unfortunately you know it's it is about mass mobilization but there are those people out there who think the earth is flat Anna as someone who studies science what's your response to that how would you convince them otherwise we all want to know yeah I think the question is a little bit bigger than that almost. I, I think we have to acknowledge that um, there are like people thinking that uh, the climate isn't changing or um, the earth is flat or like really notoriously this year that um, like vaccinations are really dangerous. Those often aren't just like conclusions that people just come to by themselves, right? They're the products of like really well-funded campaigns of misinformation. Like you can see from the 90s, um, once uh, climate change really started to become a big scientific issue. In fact, when um, uh, conferences like COP26 came up and things like that, uh, corporations like ExxonMobil poured billions of dollars into campaigns that um, said that, oh, climate change is actually not as bad as like what most people say it's going to be. Um, when that started to not work, they started to put heaps of like um, ads like touting themselves as like pioneers of like the green like movement or whatever. So my personal stance is that like I will, you know, try to really step through like any climate deniers in my life, you know, what the facts are, like why there's scientific consensus about this um, and so on. Um, but taking a step back, I need to acknowledge that uh, the reasons for those beliefs come from like bigger systemic campaigns of misinformation and be looking towards challenging those actors in this debate. Awesome, thank you. Laura, what's your response to that? Yeah, that um, that last point you made, Anna, almost made me think that's that's quite a gracious way to think of of the issue because I think we're at the point in the movement where we we don't really have time to be debating the science anymore um, because we, we you know we know what we know and we're now at the time where we need immediate action. Um, but yeah, thinking about it, if we sit with it longer, yeah, and, and consider why these ideas are still being spouted in the media, even though for us in the movement, we know them to be, to be lies. Um, yeah, it really allows you to, to arrive at a place where you can see what the the structures um, of, in our society are, are doing and and why they're trying to hold on to power um, and and allow you know like climate denies airtime because spreading doubt about those issues will will just you know allow um, the gears of capitalism to keep churning for as long as possible and to keep, you know, doing the same things um, and, you know, using, continuing to use fossil fuels at the same rate um, because that's what, you know, creates profit and, and, and power for those groups. So, so yeah, I, I, I do. And that's what they, in my degree, in my major rather at UNSW, the staff are, are really good at, at kind of letting us sit with those ideas and, and connecting the dots between different, what may seem like different issues. 
Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, Zamla, from the documentary, what have you taken away from that? What's your main takeaway and what has it influenced you to do now going ahead? I think for me, um, I know I know it's hard because um, I'm in the past, you know, I've committed to a certain level, um, but I think it just inspired me to be even more active and do even more because the more responses I'm getting um, from, you know, the, the way that I am involved, the more I, am, I feel encouraged um, to keep taking part in it. Um, so I think my kind of response was, um, you know, we need to stay connected to the root of it and not kind of block that out. Um, because, you know, as we've talked about before, it's easy to get frustrated and it's easy to get into the mindset of being like, it's not really doing anything, you know, so many people are just actively ignoring this. Um, even people in my own circle, they're actively ignoring this and actively denying things. And, you know, um, I think for me, it was just about, you know, staying connected to it. And um, yeah, like, I think the emotional response was what um, really got me going in terms of the response. Yeah. Yeah, it was really strong. Um, so you mentioned how disconnect is probably something that's going to tear, you know, it's going to cause a lot of division within types of communities. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has caused a lot of disconnect. We have all gone into our shells, bubbles, homes, and may now feel a lot more uh, taking a step back from, you know, the climate emergency. Um, how can we now, going ahead, become more connected to this as we are opening up, Anna? How can we come together again? Yeah, this is a really good question um, because I don't necessarily see the COVID-19 crisis and the climate crisis as things that are, like, really different, um, especially when you look at government responses to them. Um, so the first thing to say is that uh, there is a real scientific argument to be made that uh, you know, COVID-19 basically came about by humans intruding upon natural spaces um, and therefore having a zoonotic disease transmitted to us. Um, that is the same attitude of like, you know, humans like deciding to colonize and take up more space, more natural space, um, that is fueling the climate crisis. So I think that is like the first way in which COVID-19 and um, the climate crisis is similar. But secondly, if we look at the way in which governments have chosen to respond to these uh, crises, um, on the side of COVID-19, that looks like, uh, you know, the second time of lockdowns when they rolled around, not extending um, disaster relief payments to students who are on youth allowance and job seeker whilst not getting corporations to pay back JobKeeper. Um, and on the climate crisis end of it, um, that looks like, you know, uh, funding a gas-led recovery um, and putting a lot of money into gas corporations. And so we can see that the way that governments choose to respond to crises is to leave ordinary people, whether that be workers or students, to suffer um, and to prioritise basically the business interests um, of the biggest actors in the economy, which are corporations and the CEOs um, who often like end up being um, really influential in like the campaign, in, in running and funding um, these political campaigns. Um, so, so that's kind of like, I think the first part of that question, which is how I think COVID-19 and the climate crisis are related. Uh, when it comes back to uh, like restoring community um, uh, now that we are out of lockdown, I think that, you know, maybe hopefully like, I mean, every year um, with the climate crisis feels kind of like a turning point as we like encounter these fresh disasters and things like that. Um, but 
hopefully maybe like with climate change ranking uh, and polling like as being the number one concern of young people um, with the IPCC report coming out earlier this year with all these natural disasters like in Europe. Um, I do hope that uh, like more young people um, are kind of looking to more collective solutions for the climate crisis. Um, and, you know, if we're all super excited to get out and see our friends again, um, hopefully we sort of are also looking towards those um, collective responses um, to be the way we move forward after a really isolating period. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also have a really good question here in the chat. Um, which is how can decision makers get away with denying climate science, but expecting everyone to follow the medical science behind the COVID-19 COVID pandemic? It really hits home. And I think you touched on that a bit, Anna. Do you want to expand a little bit more on that controversy? Yes. Oh, I've never quite made that comparison before. That's so interesting. Um, like if we had the same response to um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, as we do to the climate crisis, potentially we could hit those targets that we are currently denying black and blue. Yeah, well, I think the way that decision makers get away with this um, is like, maybe to go back to that example that I talked about earlier of Scott Morrison um, kind of justifying all these responses um, after uh, uh, the IPCC report came out. Um, sometimes that's because they are really bureaucratic um, and all these like really technical structures in place, like those carbon carryover um, credits and things like that, which really help world leaders to make claims which seem really credible. And then you have to peel back those layers in order to figure out that they're just like lying to us. Um, but I also think um, it's important to note that a lot of decision makers nowadays aren't outright denying the reality of climate change. Um, instead, um, and, and we can see this because like the Murdoch media has just like released this campaign called Mission Zero, I think it is. Um, and that's quite funny because um, Obviously, in the past, they've uh, really been supporting these uh, climate sceptical views. Um, now, instead of outright denying climate science, um, they just like push forward solutions which actually aren't going to properly mitigate it. Um, so they'll be saying things like uh, the gas led recovery, um, you know, is like this transition process or like this transition fuel until like we are able to, you know, properly invest in renewables. Um, and I think now like that's the kind of claims that we need to be focusing on as opposed to like people who just totally don't think that climate change is real. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Laura, uh, the other day we mentioned how in different sectors, you may feel as us, but all studying something remotely related to this. How can people who aren't in a particular environmental industry also make a difference? In terms of education or, or like um, career path? Both um, yeah. say, how can we educate our neighbors, our people mm. in our life? And how can say someone who um, isn't say a scientist or a mathematician mm. um, use their occupation in a way that influences the people around them yeah so that's yeah again kind of a yeah a, a, a multifaceted question I think in the first case of you know people not necessarily um uh, studying a science degree I think that you know we have to give credit for community education and and non-formal um and like non yeah non-formalized modes of education and 
and acknowledge that we, we're seeing solutions and we're seeing leaders, uh, climate and activist leaders come out of spaces that, that aren't, you know, universities um, or, you know, you know, high, highly um, like businesses or, or you know, um, yeah, basically what I'm trying to say is we, we see, you know, um, leaders come out of smaller communities um, and in case of First Nations peoples, um, Indigenous communities and, and that's really how the grassroots movement was born, I think. Um, so, so yeah, I think that we can educate in different types of spaces and I think that's how um, student, even mobilizations, you know, organized by students will reach out beyond these formal university spaces and, and they, they make space for different types of communities that aren't necessarily um, from backgrounds um, like that. Um, so I'm reading Anna's contribution. <laughs> yeah, oh good. So oh, okay. Anna's just responding, um, saying how, you know, we've got a lot of new technologies that have kind of been here for a long time and we're exclaiming that, you know, technology is going to save us, but if it was going to save us, it probably mm -hmm. would have done so already. Um, and how, um, yeah, it's not really a solid response to providing a solution to climate change. Um, would you like to elaborate a little more on that? Well, that was just in response to a question, I suppose, um, which is basically, Karina, what you were saying, that um, the technology does exist for us to um, go 100% uh, renewable um, by 2030. Um, it's just that, uh, you know, right now, I think, when Scott Morrison says things like, oh, we're waiting on technology in order for us to get to net zero by 2050, the technology that he's really referring to is like carbon capture technology, which A, doesn't really exist at um, a scale that can be, you know, that can plausibly address the climate crisis. It's called trees. <laughs> yeah, it's called trees. Um, well, <laughs> secondly, um, that um, the reason why they want to push those types of technologies is so that you can, um, you know, continue to extract fossil fuels. But unfortunately, you can't net zero the groundwater that's going to be polluted because of um, fracking, and you can't net zero the ecosystems you're going to destroy, um, and you can't net zero the homes um, that are going to be burnt down from bushfires. So come capture technology, and, you know, it's not necessarily an awful thing to look at in the future, but it's a real red herring when we're looking at like, what do we really need in order to fix the climate crisis? Yeah, and it's interesting that the documentary didn't really go into, you know, technology is going to save us. It was more trying to, you know, get our politicians to listen because in the end, it's not, it's not the politicians, the people on top who are going to suffer. It's our minority groups. It's the people in nations where they don't have as much access to the finances and stability that we have here in Australia. Um, Damla, can you touch on how, you know, some people are going to be affected and generally minorities who are going to be impacted by this and the importance of that? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think um, when talking about how people who aren't on the top of the ladder are going to be affected. I think it's important to think about the people who live in areas where um, the oceans are actually rising and um, places like, I think in America and a lot of places in Florida are now going underwater and um, islands are starting to go underwater. So it's like, um, it's already happening and the people who are most vulnerable to this don't aren't really in the position to enact the type of change that is necessary for this to stop. Um, and um, the more that they kind of 
put into trying to solve the actual emergency that they're facing um, because they're losing their homes and they're losing their livelihoods, um, the more the government is looking at them and saying, oh, you're taking care of that on your own, aren't you? We're not, we're not gonna send help. We're not gonna actually um, put more money into the emergency funds to respond to this. I think um, my personal kind of relation to this was over the past year, um, there were fires in Turkey. Um, a lot of the forests were burnt down. And um, like in Australia, this happens quite frequently, not because of an accident, but um, because um, it's getting hotter and hotter every summer and it just inevitably happens. And the government didn't allocate enough money to it. Um, most of the help came from um, the communities there. It came from volunteers. And um, yeah, even if, even when the community was trying to solve the issue themselves and um, people like me overseas trying to send funds so it's actually being taken care of, the people who do have to kind of actually take care of it weren't really listening. So it's actually about getting the people who have the power to listen, um, who have the power to help to listen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'd say we live in a patchwork society where we would rather put a band-aid over something temporarily than, you know, fix where the leak actually is. Um, I've heard that Australia is a responsive society rather than a preventative society, um, which is part of the reason why we need to, you know, s stimulate our governments to actually represent the people. Um, do you have any thoughts on this, Anna? Yeah, um, I think um, if polling is anything to go by, Australians really do want um, actions to prevent the worst of the climate crisis. Um, I think it's really, then we just look at this disparity between what um, people seem to poll to want and the actions which governments seem uh, willing to take. And so the way I look at that then is, I'm like, it's that phrase that like, um, no, I'm, I'm not, um, surprised by the government, I'm just disappointed, um, because I know that there are um, profit motives for the government to just like keep burning fossil fuels until like we all go underwater. I don't see the government as like giving things to us out of the goodness of their hearts um, or because suddenly they've realised, oh my God, like climate change does exist. Like they end up doing things and like giving wins to people when like as a society like whether that's like through a protest like most commonly we've shown that something is so morally like 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 so morally bad that we won't stand for it any longer and then they give us that win um and so over a period of time we get more and more wins from the government but we shouldn't be fooled into thinking that's because they're acting from this benevolent or suddenly enlightened purpose um it's because like ordinary citizens have like gone out and forth them. Yeah. Um, we have a great question from the chat um, from Marina. Um, do you find your peers are interested? And if not, how can others be reached? Um, Laura. Maybe <laughs> Dumbler's, I see Dumbler's already responded. So I might just give um, her the oh, opportunity yeah, to elaborate. Sure. <laughs> I think um, the majority of the people that I do talk to here, they're interested and they have a concern for the environment and for the um, climate justice um, kind of whole movement, um, but they aren't actively taking um, steps in their own personal life to work towards this. They're not really listening to the right people quite complacent in the, the way that they respond to it. So when, when talking to them, I, I find this kind of um, sense that they feel quite hopeless. And um, I think what's really good about having those conversations is that, you know, 
it, when it's a group of people, they can see, oh, this person is doing this other thing that I'm, I haven't never thought of doing. And then, you know, this person, Damla is doing, you know, is involved with thoughtful food. So they get to see, okay, it's not, it's not over yet. You know, you can still do things. And the way I think people can be reached is just through a casual conversation, you can enact that kind of thought in their brain going like, hmm, maybe there is more that I can do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's great. Um, guys, we're reaching the end um, of the session. If anyone out there wants to, you know, shout out questions or write them in the chat now, it's the perfect opportunity to before we wrap up. So I'll just give you guys that opportunity to um, write, type anything or unmute yourselves if you'd like. Um, and if not, um, any final thoughts from any of the panelists? I think I just want to, yeah, reinforce what Damla just said about the peer, my, you know, the young people I know, of course, are interested in this issue. Um, but yeah, the problem perhaps for some people who aren't, or who don't know what to do about it, what to do with their that is the feeling of it's like an existential unsettling of, of being unsettled um i think that that came through from greta in the film is that it's not that it's not an issue of do you care enough it's an issue of of will i make a difference and and because you know i i see i gave the example earlier of my housemate who kind of had an existential response to not being involved enough and um questioning her her involvement and and can she even make a difference and then getting caught up in that and i think that that's where like recentering the 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 conversation around mass mobilization being part of a group and and being able to contribute as one person you can you can strengthen a movement so it's not so thinking about that kind of well hopefully i think take some of the pressure off feeling entirely responsible and 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 trying to stop climate change with your individual pur purchases for example And Anna, we have a nice comment from Lucy here saying that she really liked your choir analogy, which <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think was, was the winner. Thank yeah. You. Um, yeah, just to jump onto what Laura said for my final remarks. Yeah, if you watch the documentary, I think the last thing that you should be thinking of is like, I need to do all that I can now to reduce my carbon footprint. Um, there's actually quite a good anecdote, which is um, that the term carbon footprint was actually invented, I think, couple of decades ago by BP Oil. Um, and um, if you go on Twitter, and you, yeah, if you look up BP, they once tweeted like, um, what are you doing today to reduce your carbon footprint? And then all the comments were just things like, well, for one thing, I'm not causing an oil spill in the ocean. So like we, we need to be looking at bigger, um, but we need to be looking at um, collective solutions to the climate crisis um, and not uh, necessarily just individual ones. So the way that you can do this is if you're a university student watching in, um, see if your um, university has an environment collective. So I know that when a study you use it in UTS or have their own environment collectives and I would like um, urge you to all get involved. If you are like a worker, like can you ask your union if they're able to endorse like the next climate um, strike, for example. Um, and if there is a rally that's happening on the weekend, get in touch with one of the organizers. Like usually you can find out who's hosting the event on Facebook and just message that page and say like, is there anything I can do anywhere? I can like help pick up posters or anything and do like a bit of a post or a fly around around my neighborhood. Um, we need to reorient those solutions to ones which are collective and the ones that are being part of a bigger movement. Um, and so I'm just gonna, um, for the last time, put the link to the COP26 protest that's happening on November the 6th um, and urge you guys to get along. Uh, as Laura said earlier, um, we need to be looking at more informal ways of education and there are going to be some really great speakers. 
um, at this rally. So I would urge you all to come along for that. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, I think now we'll hand over to Helen um, for any final remarks. Well, firstly, I'd like to say thank you so much. Um, so insightful. And I think what's uh, come to me from this conversation is that I really want to speak more to the younger voices in our world. And, and I think also from that sense that the, the film about Greta being that one individual, people seeing her as this uh, climate activist hero, but bringing it back to that we can all do something, but when we do it together, it's much more impactful. Um, so I want to really want to thank you very much, um, so much for coming on board and I really appreciate um, hearing you from you. Um, I just want to, before I end up thanking you, I just want to share a slide that I have. Um, we talked about getting involved and you talked about people feeling disempowered by not being involved. Uh, there are programs that you can get involved in at Raymond Council that, but also things like just the FOGO, which is a, a food organics and garden organics program where you can just put, put your food waste in the right bin that can be collected. Uh, and we have planting uh, programs and perma B programs, bush care. There's lots of different activities you can get involved with on a smaller scale with a collective. And we also have some uh, rebates. So if you're interested in any of those, please um, look up our, our website. And also we have, um, oh, that's our feedback form. But before we do that, um, I really want to thank very much, please a big round of applause for our wonderful panellists, Danla, Anna, Laura and Karina. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your uh, insights and uh, thank you for a wonderful evening. Uh, this is being recorded. Um, so you can access that on our uh, council's YouTube. Uh, if you haven't seen the film, do see it. It's so emotionally amazing and insightful. As you said, it really motivates, motivates you to get so much more involved in this crisis that we're having. Uh, and um, thank you. And also, yes, um, I've just put in the, the link there if you wanted to get access to the film for free. All right, thanks everybody. And thank you for joining us this evening. Please, um, uh, give us some feedback on today and we'll see everybody. Have a good evening.